wanted to speak to you this morning is, as Joel said, my wife and I work with uh, White Oak Pastures. White Oak Pastures was founded in 1866. It is a sixth generation farm. We currently have the fourth and the fifth generation actually running the farm. The sixth generation, they're all about this tall. And right now they're still playing with sticks and throwing rocks at barns. But um, what's, it's been a beautiful experience learning how to work with White Oak Pastures. White Oak is a leading pioneer and a leading voice globally in the regenerative agriculture movement. And what that means is we've intentionally stayed away from monocultural linear production agricultural models. We've done this for several reasons. If you take your average, uh, your average farm, you might see they farm soy, they might farm wheat, they might farm corn, and you see these nice, neat rows everywhere you go. You can go through the breadbasket of Georgia, the southern part of the state. You can go to the breadbasket of the United States, and you see these beautiful farms. But every time you turn the soil, every time you till that soil, you're losing topsoil. You're also losing carbon. And what is the number one thing that everybody's worried about, you know, MSM and other news media sources these days? Well, it's the carbon infiltration due to human exercise and achievement in the upper atmosphere. Well, in all actuality, those carbon levels are fairly low. Mm -hmm. The reality of the situation is we've been told it's due to animal methane emissions and our cars. That does not seem to be the case. What it seems to be is that the way we are farming globally is creating a problem. In the industrial age, out of 100% of the arable farmland that we could use to grow food for civilization, we're down to about 45% now, which means that the remaining 55 to 60% of former arable land is turning to desert. It's turning to desert because when you till the land and you lose the carbon, you're taking the nutrient density mixes out of the soil. And soil, even for vegans, they think they're not killing part of nature when they source their soybean whatevers. Sorry, I can't do that. I eat about a pound and a half of beef a day. I'm never going to be a vegan. <laughs> but what you see is, what you see is when you destroy the biome in the soil, you prohibit the land from being able to produce the way it was designed by its maker. Then what is required are expensive chemical inputs. Those inputs further degrade the soil. And then to keep your crops safe, you have to massively spray with something like glyphosate, which then on top of that kills vegetation all <laughs> around your farms now your corn whatever that might stuff will probably survive but then you're going to ingest those chemical inputs and what regenerative agriculture teaches is that if you remove the chemical inputs and you get back to farming the way we used to farm back in 1866 you're going to restore the soil if you restore the soil you can restore the grasses if you restore the grasses then you can start raising herds. And we're not going to be able to turn land from desert back to lush farmland without animal impact. This won't happen. If we had the federal government, look at our national parks. We removed the wild livestock herds that's, that used to be all over the West. And how many hundreds of thousands of acres are turning to desert? When animals defecate on the land, when you see them eating and they're grazing and their saliva is getting into the soil, you're adding nutrients back into the soil. When they defecate and you get dung beetles in the soil, do you know what dung beetles do? They burrow 18 to 24 inches in and they carry dung with them in these tiny little tunnels into the ground. They lay eggs at the bottom of these tunnels and then those eggs hatch and those little dung beetles start eating their way back through the excrement, back to the surface. And along the way as they do that, it yields carbon into the soil. If you increase the amount of organic matter that is in the soil, you will not only increase the, the carbon, a uh, proper carbon footprint, carbon sequestration in the soil, you will also increase the water table. If you increase the water table, you're making your land drought resistant. Wow. If you wow. do all of these things and then you learn how to farm symbiotically, here's what I mean by that. God designed the cycles of nature to reflect design. I know that sounds like I'm being circular there, and I am a little bit. Here's what I mean. Paul the Apostle said the divine attributes of God are clearly seen throughout all creation. And I think in the modern age, we've lost some of that. We've lost our ability to see the divine, the divine attributes of God in creation. 
And what regenerative agriculture is starting to show us is not only can we see the design, it's clear that the design was made by a mind that far exceeds our own. Yeah. Here's what I mean. If you take cattle, cows, and you put them in a pasture, there's some grasses in that pasture that are going to have parasites on them that sheep don't like, but it doesn't bother the cows. So the cows will go into those pastures. They'll consume the grasses with the sheep parasite to no ill effect to themselves. We might allow the cattle to do this for a couple of days, and then we let the cattle move on so the land can rest a little bit because the cattle hooves trample everything into the soil. You want the land to rest for a little bit. Then we move sheep into the same paddock, and the sheep will then consume the grasses that have the cattle parasites on them to no ill effect to the sheep. So what you've got is the cows keeping the sheep healthy, the sheep keeping the cattle healthy, and you don't need antibiotics. So you farm, so you farm, farming is meant to be done symbiotically, man to nature, nature to the animals, back to man. It's this cycle and it grows. And Will Harris, our founder, once said, uh, he, he said this to me and to other people. And in fact, uh, I think in the video Joel was just showing, it's one of the videos we have online. You'll see Will Harris, he's being interviewed by somebody. And somebody made, the one of the interviewer made some type of a comment about church. And Will just looked at him, stuck his hands in his pockets, and he said, this is my church. Mm -hmm. And he pointed to the land. Because what he had seen there convinced him that God was real. Mm -hmm. The cool. sheer volume of the design. How it actually works. We haven't yet seen what <clears throat> nature can produce. And so at White Oak Pastures, what we work on is not only producing, the, and it's been, a, it's been an evolutionary process for us. We went from 1995 being a conventional farm, making plenty of money every year. When Will Harris made the decision to change and start exploring new options for how to conduct agriculture, he went into the red for about four years straight, but kept fighting. And here we are today, we have about 150 full-time employees on the farm. We have our own processing centers, so we don't have to send our animals somewhere else, which is better psychologically for the animals. You are what you eat. If you eat an animal that's been through a stressful situation and you ingest that muscle protein, you're gonna ingest some of that stress. It is going to impact you on some level. But if you have animals that are psychologically in great shape, you also will be in much better shape. And I gotta say, it tastes great. I can't tell you how many times I've just had a good steak for breakfast. I don't regret that at all. <laughs> if I could do that, I do that as often as I possibly can. Okay? And so there, there's a lot There's a lot we can learn. Something else that's important, at White Oak Pastures, we are not the slightest bit interested in feeding the world. We're a community farm. We want to feed our community. Our community footprint may be a little bit bigger than a lot of other local farms. We've identified our community. It's the southeast. And as Joel mentioned, we started a 501c3 on the farm called the Center for Agricultural Resilience, where we teach even in corporations. We teach corporations and local farmers how to do what we've done. There's going to be some differences. If White Oak Pastures had to build into what it is today, probably wouldn't happen. A lot has changed. But there are ways that our farmers locally can still continue to farm successfully, and they need the community support to do so. We need to know where our food comes from. I shouldn't have to look on a box label to speak to chemical inputs that I can't even pronounce, that I'm about to ingest. Mm -hmm. and, and we can't sit here and say that just because the FDA says it's okay, that therefore it is. It seems to be clear that some of our institutions in the United States have been weaponized against us. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that and we have to act locally. So White Oak Pastures is designed to be local. We mean we believe that agricultural principles need to be retaught in our communities and the communities need a connection to one another. They need a connection to the land. God designed it. We need to understand things the way they used to be done and get back to collaborating with our maker in the cycles of nature to yield the abundance that will come when we do this right. Amen. And right now, as Will Harris has said, food, the food supply globally is not resilient. And we've been able to create cheap food that is wastefully abundant. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a second. Wastefully abundant. With chemical inputs, you can have a Twinkie that's going to last for 30 or 40 years without molding. And you want to put that in your system? Mm -hmm. It's never a good idea. So what you see with White Oak Pastures is we talk about local controls. What else talks about local controls? The United States Constitution. The United States Constitution was designed to keep the federal government at a minimum, 
so that the voice of the people wouldn't be squelched in any way, shape, or form. And most decisions were called to be made at a local level. And we haven't paid attention to the reality that when we centralize power, whether it's in our food systems or in Washington, D.C., inevitably we're going to have corruption. And at some point, centralized power will destroy. That is what history has taught us. There has never been an instance where mankind with heavily centralized power has suddenly turned completely altruistic and done everything that they could for everybody else. We have not followed the Constitution, which is why we are where we are today. But we can turn this around. And I believe that what we need to do is get back to a revival of constitutional principle in this country and faith in our maker. And let me tell you what faith means. This is beautiful. This is what's exciting because in the evangelical church, we talk about faith. And what we often mean is intellectual assent to a given set of principles. That is not entirely the most accurate definition of faith. So I wanted to read a very brief paraphrase from the book of Isaiah. When we talk about how one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord, the confession Jesus Christ is Lord means this. In Isaiah 45, 23, the paraphrase is, God say, I have sworn by myself, the word of my mouth has begotten righteousness. This cannot be reversed. Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall echo my oath. When you say Jesus is Lord, that is an oath of fidelity. It is an oath of fidelity. When you get baptized, it is a statement of warfare. You are showing a newness of life through an oath you have made to the only enthroned king of the cosmos. Amen. Jesus is not just Lord of the world. The original tongue in several descriptions of his kingship and authority calls him the Lord of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. His name has been given. He has a name that is above every other name. And if we wish to restore freedom in this world, what I firmly believe is mankind is designed for a relationship with God. We have to recognize the pitfalls that come with power. And we have to be able to echo the oath that Jesus Christ is Lord is a statement of allegiance to our God and our actions because of that allegiance, our actions then line up with his will. And it may be a slow steering to getting to where we have to, where we learn, learn how to follow that will, but it can be done and it, take, it might take a lifetime and that's okay. But we've got to be thinking, I believe in this country, despite the darkness, it is time for us to assess where we are. It is time for us to assess who we are, and it is time for us to start prayerfully thinking about what we want the future to look like. I don't feel confident in trusting the power brokers in this country to tell me what my great-grandchildren need to be doing in 100 years. So what I'm convinced of is this. If we get back to our, if, let's get back to our roots. Let's get back to our daily conversations with our God. Let's get back to remembering that Christianity is a supernatural expression of God in the earth and that the supernatural is real. And as one scholar recently said, I said recently, it might have been in the past two, three years, he said, we need to wake up as Christians and realize that we're involved in a story that is more Lord of the Rings than anything. A supernatural world where somehow there are still monsters out there. And there's still a call for fidelity-driven soldiers and knights of the cross. You young men, set your sights high, okay? Don't give in. Become the men y'all are called to be in the eyes of God. You need a healthy mother and a healthy father. I hope you all have that. You will be warriors. Don't back down for a minute and be the lights in your society that society needs. You can do this. You know, the ancient Jews believed that for every person that learned how to walk with God, that God put an angel on the left and an angel on the right. So you don't go into your conflicts unarmed or alone. On top of that, the spirit of the Lord is with you and you can walk in confidence in God. Let me encourage you when you get up in the morning, give some time to him. Don't hold back and do it every day. I don't care if you feel like you hear anything or not. With all due respect, you do it anyway. Amen. All right. Amen. There's a time and a place and y'all can do what you need to do. But I, I know that we're short on time. I want to say this. I know I've covered several topics here this morning. In my mind, everything I've said is related to one massive thing. And I believe that there is a great awakening. Sorry. Sorry. Yes,
There's a great awakening coming to the world. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. They will take the oath to Jesus Christ. And we will walk in faith again the way we were meant to. God will lift us up out of our fallen places. He will heal our wounds. And if he doesn't heal all of our wounds here, he will teach us to walk despite them. We will get into heaven one day where he will prepare us for a new heaven and a new earth. And we will be coming back. And God will have his way. and He will be all in all. Amen. That is our destiny. And that is where we are heading. And we've been given a chance to have skin in the game. As you know, you know, everybody's probably familiar with the rock band Bon Jovi. I love the fact that God works in unusual ways through unusual people. Bon Jovi had a praise song he put on an album years ago. Was, the name of the album was called The Circle. The song was called Halle, which is short for Hallelujah. And it, when he got to the chorus, he says, Halle, Halle. Uh, excuse me, I've forgotten the lyrics. But the final lyric that was most important, he's basically singing Hallelujah, Hallelujah. And then he says, you've got to learn to love the world you're in. It's a very biblical command and directive. And this is nothing but a praise song in the hands of one of the biggest rock and roll bands in history. God is moving. He continues to move. I don't believe he's going to stop. I believe we have reason to be hopeful. Our hope is in our Savior. And let's remember, if we can, that our allegiance is to Jesus Christ. And we are knights in the kingdom of God. And we are called to be men of, we're called to be men who are raw high. Our wives get to be the rainbow. We're the rawhide. We're meant to be tough. We're meant to be humble. We're meant to be faithful. We're meant to be bold. Amen. Those are the ways we are made. Amen. 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 Amen.